Today, we will have Daniel Balski um, speaking after Terry Moffat um, from Duke and Columbia University, and they'll be speaking on the quantification of the pace of biological aging, the Dunedin Poll AM, I'm probably butchering the words, DNA methylation algorithm. So thank you so, so much. For now, I just want to thank both of you again for joining. It's really fantastic. And uh, yeah, we couldn't be happier to have you here. And uh, I'm not taking any more, up more of your speaking time. So welcome, Terry. Okay, thank you, Alison. So greetings, everyone, and thanks for coming along today. And special thanks to Alison for inviting Dan and me. Uh, we're quite a team. I've known Dan since he was 10 years old. So this is fun to give a talk together as grown-ups. Um, I want to start with um, this slide that shows the well-known accumulation of multimorbid diseases across the lifespan. Now, I think everyone at this meeting today shares the aim of present, preventing the onset of diseases. And if prevention is your aim, then that makes this slide makes clear that the 30s and 40s and 50s are the good target ages for intervention. And I'm gonna to try to convince you that if you wish to prevent diseases, then measuring aging in young people is essential and it's possible. Now, as you know, efforts to slow down aging in younger people have got to have a way of measuring aging in order to quantify how well the treatments work. Uh, waiting for the onset of a disease or for death as the treatment outcome will take years and years and be boring and add much too much to the cost of your clinical trial. So investigators like Steve Horvath and Morgan Levine, who you've already heard here, have been making groundbreaking progress developing DNA methylation clocks to use as measures for this purpose. But our team uh, at Duke University took a different approach. We tried to directly measure the pace of aging itself. And I'm gonna tell you that story. And after me, Daniel Belsky will tell you how our team made a DNA methylation version of our measure that you can use. Now, we've been studying aging in a cohort of 1,000 people, all born in 1972. And when we first proposed studying aging in this cohort, the NIH peer reviewers scoffed at us. They believed that there would not be any variation on measurements relevant to the study of aging in people that were that young. Um, but the first thing we observed was that there is definitely variation in aging among people many years before they are older adults. Now, this slide shows you composite faces from digital photos of 10 female and 10 male cohort members from our birth cohort of 1,000 participants. The photos were taken within 60 days of their 45th birthday. These are composites too, but these are the 10 fastest aging 45 year olds in the birth cohort. All the people in this birth cohort were born in the same year, 1972. And you can see there's obviously enormous variation in our participants pace of aging, as you can see in their faces. We wanted to quantify this biological aging. Now we thought age of aging as a life course process, uh, first, we know that exposures that cause age-related diseases accumulate starting from very early in life. We know that changes to physiology occur many years before disease diagnosis. Uh, we know that organ damage is difficult to reverse fully once it's established. And this all goes together to suggest that preventive interventions must begin early if we aim to slow aging and extend health span. We think research is needed to understand the processes of aging in young people if we intend to intervene and change these processes. But how can we measure how fast a young person has been aging? I want to introduce you to our primary research tool, which is called the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development Study. Here's the design of the study. At the top, you see all 1,037 babies were enrolled at birth in 1972-73. They're all the babies born in one city in one year. Ethnically, the cohort is white European descent. If you look down the left column, that shows you the ages of data collection. There have been 13 assessments since babyhood. Each time we assess the cohort members, each of them spends a full day in our clinical setting uh, for data collection. And now they stay overnight and spend half the next day doing scanning. Down at the bottom, you see the last completed assessment wave was at age 45 in 2019, when 94% took part. 
Now, when the cohort were in their 30s, we wanted to convert this study of early childhood development into a study of aging. So we began to collect measures used every day in geriatric medicine. I'm going to show you a few photos of some of the assessments to give you an idea. We repeat these every time we assess the Dunedin study members. And these are just examples to give you an idea. I'm going to go swiftly because these measures are familiar already uh, to most of you. So here you see postural hypotension, uh, bone density in a DEXA scan, uh, a speech and noise test of auditory processing, a physical function test, we have a complete uh, battery of physical function. This shows you the 30 second chair stand uh, and the gait right walk speed assessment. Uh, we do a complete ophthalmological examination and retinal imaging is part of that. Also an optic nerve scan. Uh, there's a complete dental examination, everybody's favorite. Uh, there's a complete respiratory assess assessment uh, with plethysmographic testing of lung function. Uh, we draw lots and lots of blood for biomarkers and genomics. Uh, we do cognitive neuropsych testing. And uh, as of age 45, we started doing brain imaging. Um, what I'm showing you here is white matter hyperintensities data. I'm showing this because according to the neurology literature, white matter hyperintensities only begin to be detectable after age 60. But you can see the histogram on the right shows we did find variation at age 45, and that's because we have really sensitive scan resolution. Now, because we were gathering all these data, we got interested in what geroscientists were saying about their operational definition of aging. They defined aging as the gradual, progressive, coordinated deterioration of physiological integrity across multiple bodily systems. So decline across organ systems that is synchronized and is happening simultaneously. Now, in the Dunedin study, we had been tracking 19 biomarkers since the 1,000 study members were in their 20s. And you see the biomarkers here. The question is, would these biomarkers show evidence of mean level decline across the cohort's middle decades of life? I'll show you four examples. Here's mean VO2 max for the whole cohort of 1,000 people. Uh, it measures cardio fitness on an exercise bike, and it declines steadily from age 26 to 32 to 38. I don't have age 45 on the slide yet, but trust me, it keeps declining at age 45. Now, the cohort's mean lung function also declined from age 26 to 32 to 38 to 45. Their mean blood pressure rose steadily from age 26 to, 30, to 32 to 38 to 45. And we got the same pattern for prediabetes testing, HbA1c also shows that pattern of age-related change. I'm not gonna show you all 19 of the biomarkers one by one, uh, but this slide depicts an eyeball look at the data for 19 of biomarkers. Virtually all of them did show gradual, progressive, coordinated worsening of physiological functional integrity. And this was across multiple bodily systems. But some of our cohort members are declining really fast and others are hardly declining at all. So to capture these differences between individuals, we calculated 19 growth curves, one for each of these repeated biomarker measures, and we then combined the curves to model what we called the pace of aging. Now, each individual in the cohort ends up with a score that represents the gradual change in each of the 19 biomarkers that is synchronized with the change in the other 18. The green histogram shows you the distribution of the pace of aging scores in the cohort. It's plotted in years of biological change per chronological year. On the left, you see there are some individuals who show almost no biological aging between age 26 and 45. They're the lucky few. Um, they are remaining young. But on the right, you see that some of the cohort members have aged almost two years per chronological year over the 20 years that we followed their biomarkers. 
So next, we wanted to validate the pace of aging measure score by testing if it predicted cohort members' outcomes on cognitive, perceptual, and sensory motor kinds of measures that are used in geriatric medicine. The full report was in Nature Aging this summer. I'll just give you a few concrete examples. Here you see that the fast agers already have poorer balance at age 45 than the slow agers. The white circle reminds me to tell you that each data point on this slide represents 20 of the 938 cohort members who took part at age 45. The fast agers also had more decline on tested cognitive function. And we started testing their cognitive function in childhood uh, and have followed uh, with the same test up until age 45. And the fast agers even had faces that were rated as older looking at age 45. Now we looked inside the brain too in these validation studies, a, past, a faster pace of aging score was associated with a thinner cortex and smaller surface area of the brain as assessed by MRI at age 45. What you see with the blue parcels of the brain are parcels that passed correction for multiple testing. So now that we have a measure of the pace of aging, we need to move randomized clinical trials from an exclusive focus on disease endpoints to tracking the pace of aging. Now, a good measure has got to be sensitive to change in trials of anti-aging therapies. So it can be used at pretreatment baseline. Uh, you can characterize people before they start a treatment so that you can study who will respond best to anti-aging treatments, fast agers or slow agers. You can track change in treatment response during the randomized trial. And with post-treatment outcome, you can track long-term follow-up. This is gonna be a necessary question. Will the treatment effects last or are they gonna fade out? We've translated our pace of aging measure to an epigenetic methylation signature. And we've recently named it Dunedin PACE, which is a little bit easier to say than some other labels that we had for a while. Uh, so now you can measure the pace of aging in your own research participants, even if you don't have a five decade longitudinal study or a lot of biomarkers. So at this point, I want to hand off to Daniel Belsky, and he's going to tell you how this methylation measure has been faring in research. Thanks very much for letting me tell you about this development work. Okay, thank you so much, Temi, uh, for the wonderful background and introduction of the pace of aging. Um, and I'll see if I can pick up here to tell people about uh, the Dunedin pace algorithm. Um, is my contact information and, and so forth if, if anyone needs to, to reach out with questions and, and so forth. Uh, there's the disclosure to the, the true diagnostic that Temi put up before. Here's the early thank you slide. Uh, to all of the funders who supported the work, uh, to, to Temi, to Afshan Kaspi, uh, her long-term collaborator and partner in, in all of this, to David Corcoran and Karen Sugden, uh, who, who helped develop this measure, uh, and to Richie Poulton, who's been leading the team on the ground in uh, New Zealand for all these many years, as well as uh, some folks at Columbia, uh, Andrea Baccarelli, Zhu Gao at Peking University, Mike Kobor and David Lin at uh, University of British Columbia, and then Bill Krauss, Virginia Krauss, and Kim Hoffman, uh, at Duke and the calorie trial. Okay, um, just to recap where we're starting here, here's the little geroscience cartoon, molecular changes accumulate, driving declines in system integrity, uh, causing functional decline, disease, disability, and mortality. Uh, we think based on animal experiments that intervention on these molecular changes can delay or prevent the declines in system integrity uh, and, and, and extend healthy lifespan. Um, the problem as Temi articulated is that uh, doing follow-up from a human trial of such an intervention would take an awfully long time, uh, and so surrogates are needed. And the surrogates uh, that are the sort of current gold standard that we're working with in the field are these measures of what we call biological age, or uh, how much older or younger you are than we expect you to be based on your birth date and, and the year when we're measuring you. Um, and as sort of a preface to introducing the Dunedin Pace algorithm, I want to talk about uh, what some limitations of this biological age construct are that motivated us to seek the, the Dunedin PACE method and the pace of aging. Um, so there are three challenges that I'll, I'll sort of step through quickly on the way to the Dunedin PACE. Uh, the first of these um, is mortality selection. And that very simply is the fact that if we're trying to measure biological age, 
from comparisons of old people and young ones, we face the challenge that the older folks represent a fundamentally different population. They are the survivors. So when we think about somebody we're recruiting into our study who may be 70 years old, almost by definition, they've aged more slowly than the 50% of their birth cohort who have not survived to be measured at that same age. Uh, a second challenge uh, that Temi's written about a good deal are these cohort effects. These are differences in exposure histories of people born at different times in history. So that 70 year old, although they may be a survivor relative to the 20 year old, has had a life history characterized by a very different exposure profile than the young people we might be comparing them to. And that exposure history includes uh, environmental toxicants, pathogen burdens, as well as changes in health behavior like smoking. And then finally, there's the question, and this is the most critical one, I think, when we, we're talking about geroprotector trials of uncertain timing. We don't know when the degree of advancement or delay that we see in a person's biological age has occurred. Uh, and there's a little figure here from a paper last year from the Gladyshev lab. They have another one out more recently with uh, even more uh, compelling data um, to illustrate how exposures, events occurring at the very beginnings of life structure molecular pictures of biological aging. Uh, and so when we observe uh, a person with uh, a molecular age profile that looks older or younger than we expect it to be, it doesn't provide us information on when that age difference has become established. And in turn, the extent to which it may be amenable to an intervention that aims to slow uh, the process of biological aging. Okay, so with that as preface, here's biological age. This is, you know, the clock uh, metaphor. Uh, and here's, here's where we're after this kind of pace of aging construct. Um, uh, again, Temi mentioned the, the sort of generation one pace of aging, this Dunedin POAM measure. Um, and uh, we reported in this eLife paper that, that it was in fact possible to distill the first, uh, the original sort of pace of aging measure into a methylation algorithm. Um, and that the resulting methylation algorithm was predictive of functional decline, morbidity, uh, and mortality. Um, but it had some limitations, and, and I'll just harp on two of them before I finally get to the, the data you've uh, all presumably come to see. The first of these is that the initial pace of aging had a limited life course follow-up. It was based on uh, an extraordinary amount of data. Uh, the Dunedin study has, has always been a leader in having more data on more people than, than anybody else, um, but still just 12 years spanning the transition from young adulthood to midlife and only three time points. And if there are any uh, growth modelers in the audience, they'll know that having three time points is the bare minimum you need to estimate a person's rate of change. Um, but having more will give you a great deal more precision in your estimates. And then the second challenge um, which we were alerted to first by uh, work that Karen Sugden published uh, last year in Cell Patterns with, with Temi and Avshalom and, and the rest of us. Um, uh, and more recently, I think has been brought to uh, wider attention by Morgan Levine's lab's preprint is that the reliability of DNA methylation data is not great. Uh, the test retest reliability or the intraclass correlation coefficient for this uh, kind of G1 pace of aging measure is about 0.8 to 0.9, which is okay. It's consistent with what we see for the other DNA methylation clocks. But if you want to test whether your drug or your treatment slows aging by comparing a person's baseline value pre-treatment to their post-treatment follow-up, that's not going to cut it. You're going to deal with a lot more error in measurement, uh, uh, and you're going to need a much bigger effect to generate uh, a detectable result. So uh, we undertook uh, efforts toward refinement. Uh, and the first of these, as Temi has just shared with you, is this substantial extension in follow-up uh, for quantification of the pace of aging itself. Uh, that's Max Elliott and his paper from last year. Um, and again, this is looking at a fourth time point of follow-up and essentially an additional decade of human aging that gets uh, incorporated into this pace of aging measure. And the second is the integration of the results from, from Karen's work to identify the relatively, I say relatively because they're still not perfectly reliable, but the relatively more reliable subset of probes on the Illumina array. Um, and from modeling those uh, subset of reliable probes, uh, we identify this novel Dunedin Pace algorithm. It consists of 173 CPG sites, uh, which uh, when weighted produce this normally distributed value in the Dunedin cohort centered around the average pace of aging, which is one year of physiological change per chronological year. And that unit, that scaling unit is gonna stay with us uh, over the course of the presentation. And it's worth keeping in mind that it corresponds to the expected rate of aging 
over that 20 year interval from a person's mid twenties to their mid forties. So this is sort of healthy adult lifespan pace of aging. And we're gonna ask whether that goes faster or slower in different groups of people. So I wanna uh, hit this reliability point uh, first and uh, with, with, with some uh, intention. Um, you're seeing data on the left-hand side of your screen from two replicates uh, uh, of EPIC methylation arrays from blood samples in 36 individuals. This is a public data set. Um, the, the geo accession is down there at the bottom. The lead author of the paper that published it um, is, is Lane. Uh, and you can see uh, those data and from uh, two additional data sets that Karen published in her paper on the right-hand side of the slide, plotting these ICCs for test retest reliability in these different measures. And our measure, Dunedin Pace, on the far left of the slide, the gold dot uh, shows superior test retest reliability to most of, of the other measures in the field. Um, and what we think is, is adequate for um, testing change from pre-treatment baseline to post-treatment follow-up, but I'll get back to that as we go forward. Um, and the, you know, if you're taking notes, the statistic is uh, 0 0.96. Um, so the next thing we wanted to know is, does this, Dunedin pace measure give us information about the pace of aging that's consistent with what we know from other sources. We know from demography that the pace of aging accelerates as people grow older, the force of mortality increases, death rates accelerate. And that's what we see with the pace of aging here in data from the Understanding Society study, faster pace of aging in older adults. This is not a clock. We are not trying to measure how old they are. We're measuring how fast they're aging and that rate is accelerating across the lifespan. The second thing we did was look at whether people who the Dunedin pace algorithm measures to be aging faster look biologically older uh, by existing technologies. And here you see correlations between the Dunedin pace measure and the what are called age acceleration residuals from these four benchmark DNA methylation clocks. And the correlation is the strongest uh, with the grim age, which of course is the one most predictive of morbidity and mortality in prior work. Um, here are the morbidity and mortality data for Dunedin Pace. Uh, here from the normative aging study uh, and the Framingham Heart Study offspring cohort, you can see effect sizes uh, for mortality on the right-hand side of the slide. And uh, if you prefer to look at survival curves, those are on the left-hand side of the slide, although only for the Dunedin Pace measure. Uh, slow agers in blue, fast agers in red. Um, uh, and what you can see again is the effect sizes are um, uh, similar to the Grim Age clock and, and somewhat larger than those for the, the bench, the other benchmark clocks. Uh, it's worth noting on the far right hand side, the Grim Age statistic for Framingham is probably uh, a bit of an overestimate. Grim Age was developed within the Framingham Heart Study. Um, here are some data on chronic disease incidence and prevalence in the normative aging study. So here we're predicting forward to the onset of chronic disease. Again, Dunedin Pace is performing uh, as well as or better than uh, these benchmark clocks. Um, uh, and, and finally, some data uh, not yet published from Karen's analysis of the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative data. Uh, this is just one figure from her paper um, uh, showing that the Dunedin Pace algorithm distinguishes uh, dementia and uh, mild cognitive impairment from cognitively normal older adults. So um, uh, Dunedin Pace is, is, although it captures, we think, a different underlying quantity, the pace of aging rather than biological age, similarly predictive of uh, clinically relevant endpoints, personally relevant endpoints, um, to the benchmark DNA methylation clocks. Uh, but what ultimately I think many of us are concerned with is, is it able to tell us whether this works? Can we find out from a DNA methylation test, whether an intervention is gonna slow biological aging. Um, and so I'm gonna show you now the data from the calorie trial. This is a, a first of its kind randomized controlled trial of long-term calorie restriction. That's two years of 25% calorie restriction prescribed uh, in 220 non-obese adults. They're randomized at a two to one ratio uh, to the, the CR treatment, that's calorie restriction or the, the ad libitum uh, control group. Um, uh, and we have DNA methylation data at baseline 12 months and 24 months for uh, about 200 of these folks. Uh, and, and, you know, full disclosure, Calorie uh, tried to get to 25% CR in the intervention group. CR is awfully hard. Um, and the average treatment effect in the treatment group was about half the prescribed dose. Nevertheless, uh, Calorie is established to have uh, benefits to cardiometabolic health 
We've previously published analysis of blood chemistry biological age algorithms indicating uh, calorie slowed aging. Uh, and this work uh, was designed to test whether we could see evidence of that same phenomena at the molecular level. Um, here are the data for those benchmark DNA methylation clocks. Uh, what I'm showing you in the graphs on the right-hand side of the slide are changes from baseline, blue for the control group, red for the calorie restriction treatment group. What we're hoping to see here, the expectation is that uh, we're going to see a straight blue line sloping upward from zero to one to two. That's baseline one year and two years of follow-up. That's how the epigenetic clocks are supposed to tick forward. Um, and then uh, ideally, we would see uh, a red line charting a slower rate of increase for the calorie restriction group. Now, that's roughly what we see for the grim age clock, uh, uh, a slower rate of increase in the calorie restriction group than the control group. Um, but that's not what we see for the other three clocks. In fact, if anything, the pattern appears to be in the opposite direction. Um, uh, here are the data for the pace of aging measures. Um, and here what we're expecting is relatively straight or flat curves for the control group. We don't expect the pace of aging to change. Um, and then we expect them to be affected in the negative direction in the CR group. The pace of aging should be slowed. It should go down. Um, and we see evidence of that with both measurements and, and a much stronger signal for uh, the new Dunedin pace algorithm. Um, these are hard plots to compare uh, between the clocks and the pace of aging and even between the different clocks because the, the standard error of measurement is not the same. Um, so I'm gonna show you next uh, data on a standardized scale. So these are, these are treatment effects scaled based on standard deviations of the measure uh, computed from the baseline pretreatment data. Uh, we can interpret them as a, as a kind of Cohen's D treatment effect. Uh, and there what you see is effects in the expected direction for, for grim age, for the pace of aging, not, you know, not different from zero, but, but opposite expected for the other clocks. Um, and, and it's only uh, the, this Dunedin pace algorithm that gives us a reliable uh, signal different from zero that pace of aging was slowed. Um, and to the question of, of why, why do we see a stronger signal for Dunedin pace than we do for some of the other measures, measures I, I think the, the superior test retest reliability is probably the explanation for why the stronger result relative to the, the first generation pace of aging. Um, with respect to grim age, which has a reliability more similar to Dunedin pace, I think it may have to do again with this pace of aging method versus the biological age method. Grim age is recording differences accumulated across the entire lifespan. Um, and it, it may be less sensitive to changes in how fast aging is occurring uh, accumulated over just the past couple of years. Um, so with that, uh, I'll leave you with some sort of conclusions and next steps and we can open it up to questions. So we think this, this algorithm is a new tool for geroscience. It'll be available to everyone soon. Um, uh, and I just offer the, the caveat that um, so far much of this work has been conducted in populations that are um, are of white European descent. Uh, and it's critical to establish the validity of these measurements in other populations, both within the United States and around the world, uh, as we roll them out as uh, uh, surrogate endpoint benchmarks for geroscience clinical trials. So thanks. Uh, thanks to Allison. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for sticking it out. And uh, we look forward to your questions. Uh, wow. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. This is lovely. Um, all right, for anyone who uh, would like to join on a gallery view, uh, which may be nice for the discussion, um, I'm opening up for a gallery view now. Thank you so, so much. Um, you already had lots of questions in the chat, and uh, I think many people are yeah, quite impressed <laughs> quite impressed by the results. Um, thank you so much uh, for presenting and also on such a short time in, in terms of leaving a lot of time open for questions and for discussions, because I think there's many. All right, so um, I'm having a few, and if Keith Keith's question has already been answered. Then the first one to go here would be Creon, followed by uh, Ronald Kohansky, uh, and then we'll take it uh, take it away. So this is a reminder. Please put your questions in the chat uh, if you'd like to be next. Thank you. Okay, I'll go then. Um, so first, a quick question, which is on your last slide. Could you explain that statistic and what it? what it, the significance of that statistic is that all those different uh, clocks got assigned uh, on that um, sure. plot. And, and then uh, secondly, just to add it in, um, uh, on the CR, it's a very hard experiment to do. Compliance is difficult to maintain. What about doing an intermittent fasting version 
or a carbohydrate restriction version, both of which are much easier to do than just full on caloric restriction, as well as, of course, caloric restriction mimetics like conformin. So the first question was, what does this effect size mean? Um, which is a good one. Uh, and so the, the challenge we have is that the epigenetic clocks, for example, appear to have this very straightforward effect size metric. It's years of biological age, um, but they're not actually equivalent to one another. So um, the standard deviation of the age acceleration residual, that is the part of the clock that's left over after you take out chronological age, um, is you know in the neighborhood of five for, for example, the Horvath and Hannum clocks, maybe a little higher for Hannum, somewhere around there for, for the Levine clock, the Pheno age clock, Grim age has a standard deviation of about three. So maybe it's a more accurate predictor, but the point is a year isn't a year isn't a year. Uh, and so we need some kind of standardized scaling metric if we're gonna compare these measures head to head in a single trial. Um, and a measure that is commonly used in the behavioral sciences where there are no natural scales is the standard deviation unit. We know that these age acceleration residuals for the clocks are normally distributed because regression residuals are normally distributed by construction. Um, and we know that the pace of aging is normally distributed because uh, Temi's done the work to figure that out. Um, so uh, we can use the standard deviation, which is a, a typical description of that normal distribution as a scaling metric to quantify these treatment effects. Now, if the question is how much was aging slowed if we have a treatment effect of let's say 0.25, what does that mean? Uh, it means if we take the metric of the pace of aging, literally, that the pace of aging was slowed by a couple of percent in these people. Um, is that a lot or a little? I don't know. Um, but that is, that is what I can say about the, the magnitude of these effects. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. To add to that, if, if your suggestion is to uh, fund clinical trials of, uh, of other approaches rather than just caloric restriction, then um, Ron Kohansky is on the call. So he probably heard that. Yeah, I think the answer with respect to, uh, for example, intermittent fasting is it's full speed ahead. NIA is, uh, is on their way and, and our measure hopefully will be there waiting for the trialists when uh, the data come in. Thank you very much. Well, Great. That is a great segue because uh, Ronald had this, the next question. So Ronald, you go. Uh, hi, Terry, Daniel. Uh, always a pleasure listening to your talks. I have to say, I'm not stalking you. I am following your presentations as often as I can. Um, so if you were doing a clinical trial and this you have this division of slow, average, and fast agers, would you expect that the fast agers are those who would benefit or show the biggest delta, if you will, from an intervention to slow the rate of aging? It's a loaded question. It is a loaded question. I can make predictions both ways. I can think that the the people who are already aging slow would are would so would be at a ceiling effect, so they're not able to age much any slower. Uh, and so, if you include slow agers in your clinical trial, you're sort of um, handicapping yourself, and you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to get much of an effect size uh, for the outcome. On the other hand, you might say that the fast agers are already have you know gone too far in the direction of organ damage, and therefore it might be difficult to reverse that that damage that's already happened. And so what you would want to do is start your trial with um, medium agers and see if you can slow them down. So, uh, you know, we may get one of those very rare things in science, which is with the very slow and the very fast uh, don't show much of, of an effect size. And you would you could preload your trial with people who are sort of average agers and exclude people who are extreme agers. Um, if, if I were running a trial, that might be my uh, strategy. But I think as long as we don't know before the trial starts whether someone is already aging fast or slow, we can't pre-register that interaction term between the treatment and their initial uh, pace of aging. And so uh, the FDA takes a dim view of post hoc you know, tests, uh, look, uh, looks for um, uh, subgroups who were sensitive to the trial, as you know. It's really great if you can pre-register those kinds of uh, analyses before the trial starts, much more compelling. And I think you know, assessing whether you use pace of aging or clocks or other biomarkers, uh, it would be a good idea for trials to have 
pre-data that they can then pre-register the moderation hypotheses. Lovely, thank you. What would be the time window to get good pre-trial data? One year, three years on, on a population? So I think the, the hypothesis, at least motivating the development of these methylation algorithms is that you could observe them at pre-treatment baseline uh, or at, at enrollment screening and stratify that way. Uh, you know, if you're thinking about actual repeated measures, longitudinal follow-up of physiology, um, I think that's a, that's a different question. We have some evidence that a decade is enough time. Uh, it, the question is, could we do it faster? Um, I, I don't know, Tammy, maybe you have some intuition about. Uh... No, and people always say to me when I submit papers to journals, the reviewers always say, why didn't you measure these people every year annually so that you could have you know, a series of 20 years of annual biomarkers? And I say, that's great, good idea, <laughs> uh, but neither the study members nor the funding agency uh, is fond of the idea. So we see them as often as we can. Yeah, thanks. Lovely. Keith. Yes, uh, my questions, which are follow-ups to the ones I put in the chat, are kind of perfectly segued by what you just said there, Terry, uh, <laughs> which is, uh, I'm very curious, uh, you know, in the earlier part of the talk where uh, you were discussing, you know, dental carry, retinal test, Horvath clock, this and that, um, I'm very curious as to how the accuracy of each one of those biomarkers how they scale based on more waves, right? Because for example, maybe the Horvath clock, maybe it's not that useful to get it every day. It's gonna tell you pretty much the same thing. I don't know. But facial biomarkers, I imagine could swing wildly on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you get bad sleep, et cetera, et cetera. But if you got it every day for a year, uh, and I have some outside knowledge to, to indicate that, that it might become extremely predictive for age. And so the point is that if that is true, and it's very correlated to pace, et cetera, et cetera. I would imagine it would become a much easier sell to have it become ubiquitous if all you needed to do was just have every trial, people have a, a picture of their face that's taken in a normalized way, because that's not a lot of money. That's not a lot of stuff. And if you can show that that's pretty much, you know, 90% correlated to the full Megillah, let's get that going on. And then that can open the door to everything else discuss. Yeah, I, I'm going to say something to give Daniel a, a chance because we did experiment. We, you know, we had three waves to, st to start with in 2015 when Daniel published his first paper about this. Since then, we followed up the sample, the cohort later, and we got a fourth wave. And so he can tell you uh, what adding just one wave of information uh, does. Um, so maybe do you want to mention about that, Daniel? I mean, the the idea if you could take facial photographs every every day for a year would be amazing. And maybe I'll start doing it for myself. Um, what we did when the, with this modeling, the idea of having multiple waves of, of data across time was that it's clear that any one of the biomarkers, one or two of them could spike up into an abnormal range on a short-term way. And that would just be a temporary health problem. Like your C-reactive protein could spike up if you happen to have an infection on board on the day that we assess you. But if we assess you on three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 occasions, we can, um, that noise that is temporary health problems and sicknesses uh, is then erased. And what we're looking at then is the long-term trend, which is meets more the geroscience definition of aging. So that's the value to us of having multiple uh, ways of data to model this. Whether you add more information with subsequently more and more and more waves, um, maybe Daniel would want to say something about that. I think that, um, so the question of what is the optimal density of measurement for something like this is, is a really good one. Um, and it's going to depend a little bit about the kind of measures you're taking. Um, because as you note, there are some measures for which uh, a sort of ultra dense uh, measurement design is going to contribute, you know, mostly noise and not a lot of additional signal. Um, uh, and it, it could be quite expensive. For something like these facial images, uh, you know, a low cost, uh, passively accumulated measurement, 
Uh, there's a lot of potential there, but you got to show that it, it means what you think it means. Um, correlation with these surrogates is good. Prediction of hard outcomes is better. Um, and I think we already know from facial recognition technology, uh, there's a lot of uh, subtlety in uh, sort of what makes these, these algorithms work the way they do. Um, and so what gets detected as aging uh, may or may not be this, this underlying process of aging, even if it is something that ultimately, you know, makes you ill and kills you. Um, and I think that matters if we want to sort of slot it in as a surrogate endpoint for a, an intervention designed to modify biological processes of aging specifically, rather than, for example, um, you know, skin rejuvenation or, or more sleep or something like that. Thank you. All right, next one we have Aaron. Hey, yeah. Um, how did you guys choose your array of biomarkers to test? Okay, I, Daniel wasn't around then. He was a little kid, so I can try to take this question. Um, we started tracking these biomarkers in the study members. Really, you know, we were studying asthma and and um, drug abuse and things like that when they were teenagers. So we were taking some biomarkers. Uh, at that time, but then when they were in their 20s, we got serious about wanting to study their health outcomes. Um, so, uh, but we were not at all thinking that we would ever study AG. So it was only really after Horvath's clock came out that we thought, oh, this is kind of important and let's try to model this. So basically we had to look backwards in the archives of the study to see what biomarkers we happened to have. And the ones that uh, we had a lot, but we could only use the ones that we had at least three waves because that's required for the statistical modeling of a growth curve. So really it was made, it was selected based on a statistical basis. When we, when we started collecting biomarkers, our, our main objective was just to represent health of all the different organ systems of a person in their 20s. And then as they've gone forward, we've added more biomarkers um, as they've gone along, but we, we, needed, uh, we needed multiple waves in, in, in the archive. So that's how we chose. Uh, okay, all right, I see. Okay, Nicola, you're next. Yeah, so I, I wanted just to uh, get back to one of the slides, uh, the one that was showing the chronological age against the um, Gendelian phase. And so I was wondering if the, the increase that you're showing, if it's monotonic or if there's an inflection at some point, and especially around the age of 60, and if you have looked at that, if the variance starts to increase around 60, um, if there's something, a threshold that is happening there. Yeah, so I mean, I think people are certainly very interested in this question. It's a good one. Uh, it's why you know we've we've shown you a scatter plot here of, of all the data in this particular study. Um, there's no obvious inflection point in these data uh, around age 60 that that I see, um, and you know because it's only you know about a thousand people, our statistical power to identify a subtle shift in the variance is limited. Uh, but this is the kind of question that as we accumulate multiple data sets, uh, we will be able to go after uh, with some more vigor. I should note that um, because of mortality selection, the expectation we have of expanding variants with advancing chronological age uh, is, is, is going to be you know, kind of limited uh, by, by the fact that you, you just can't be aging that fast and be that old. I mean, we do see that one man out there. Um, aging crazy fast at age 79 or whatever. Um, but, but whether he represents you know, what, what we're gonna get in a population or not, I, I think we don't know. Uh, and in fact, what you can see a hint of in these data, and, and you can also see them in uh, uh, data from other uh, large studies of older adults, is that the variance uh, winnows at the oldest ages. Uh, people's pace of aging is still faster, um, but, but not quite as fast as it is a bit younger. And it may be because the sort of carrying capacity for a rapid rate of aging is eroded by the aging process itself. And so those people are just not in the population anymore. Thank you, Thank you so much. Also to add that the pace of aging itself was developed and modeled on data in, in this cohort of 1000 people from age 26 to 45. So there's no healthy survivor bias there. They haven't started dying yet and they don't have diseases yet. They didn't have you know, heart attacks or, or cancer or anything like that. 
Um, so that's one advantage of doing this research in younger cohorts is that uh, you, you get much uh, you know, better variation and it's real variation, it's population variation uh, that you know about. Lovely, thank you, Carl. So uh, this is great work. I love this data and um, it's great to see a, a different approach to clocks or, um, I mean, in this case, I guess you would call them speedometers or we need a new word that encompasses both of those concepts, I guess. Um, but so that's kind of the issue I wanna get at, um, which is sort of, can you talk about why you know, did, did this kind of idea that pace of aging might be a more useful than instant time point clock? Um, you know, I, I think we can dismiss the first generation sort of methylation clocks that were trained on just predict your chronological age. Uh, for obvious reasons, I think your points about um, survivorship bias are excellent. Um, but then, you know, the second generation clocks, the idea is predicting time till death. So why is rate of aging or pace of aging a better concept on which to test interventions than time till death in terms of if you want to see whether you're really reversing the current state of biological age is my intuition as to what you want to do. Um, so can you talk about that a little bit? And I have a follow up about about mice, maybe. Daniel, shall I say something about the cohort noise? Um, so when you have a data set that has people, let's say, aged 18 to 80 and um, you ascertain their biomarkers so that you have, um, you know, what's their current health and you train your methylation uh, data set based on that. Uh, it's mixing up both temporary sickness, which is not aging with actual aging effects. So there's a source of noise that you can't exclude with that one wave of training data. Um, so that's the beauty of having multiple waves. The beauty of having all the people in the study born in the same year is that there is, isn't any way that their physiology and the, and the function of their organ systems can have be, been differentially affected by things that were in their environment when they were children. So take, for example, these data sets that have been used to, to train, um, say, you know, the, the Clara, Clamera Duval age, you know, biological age variable that was used to train uh, in, you know, previous clocks, some previous clocks. Um, people who were in the data set who were in their 80s um, had quite different childhoods in terms of exposure to lead, exposure to uh, antibiotics, exposure to vaccinations, exposure to, uh, you know, nobody had in the United States had air conditioning before the 1960s, 1970s, so they had heat stress in their childhood. So there's been a lot of uh, environmental exposures for those old people that young people in the same data set didn't have. I don't consider that kind of toxic environmental exposure aging. So it adds noise. So what we know is they're just sources of noise uh, and we don't know how noisy they are or how bad they are. The research hasn't been done to evaluate them, but in theory, they could be a problem for interpretation of the clock age as, bio, as aging per se. I think the other sort of comment to make there, so if we, that, you know, that I think you make a good point that mortality selection is somewhat mitigated by uh, modeling survival in the clock development process, um, although perhaps not entirely. Uh, and I, you know, there was just a, a comment in the chat about statistical power because at the end of the day, we we observe fewer deaths than we do individuals in these data sets. But I think that that you know the cohort effect problem is very real. We know these cohort pattern exposures do impact the methylome in enduring ways. And so they, they can show up as artifacts in, in some of these clocks. Um, but I think it's the uncertain timing issue that is the real uh, challenge when it comes to thinking about, is this appropriate for my intervention trial or not? And if you are designing an intervention to turn back the clock, to rejuvenate with big effect, then probably you're fine. In fact, you may even want something like a clock that tells you biological age because that's the what that's what's going to be sensitive to you know a reversal of aging by 10 years okay but if you think your intervention is likely to have a somewhat more modest effect if what it's going to do 
is slow the accumulation of these molecular changes that drive aging, dial them back only modestly. Then you want a measurement that is focused on the rate of change, the rate of deterioration in the organism ongoing during the course of the intervention, because that's the quantity that your intervention is actually going to manipulate. So, so I think you know, the, the answer is ultimately, it depends on what, you, you know, what, what effect you wanna test. Um, but I think my intuition about many of the interventions that are gonna be feasible to give to humans, especially in large numbers, is that uh, they're going to slow the pace of aging um, and to the extent that they rejuvenate, that rejuvenation will be moderate. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, I fully understand there are many out there who have uh, a very different view, and there are some animal data that suggests that that alternative view is at least possible. Okay, so that's a. I, I like your answer a lot. Um, so let me do a. a to, so the follow-up question is: um, Your data could be used in a way to create a point in time clock that predicts morbidity. You don't have a big enough cohort yet for mortality, but you could train a clock using the grim age type methodology to specifically predict the decline in function over the decade long time frame. Would that clock be that be much different from what you ended up with with your Dunedin pace? And, and is that a worthwhile thing to do with your data? Anyway, think about that. All right. I think, yeah. food for thought. I thought he wanted to just leave it hanging in the air like this. I yeah, do think it's thought. food for thought. We do have all of the all of the variables that would be needed. And so that could be a good empirical question. For example, we have their pack years recorded and pack years of cigarette smoking is one of the factors that feeds into uh, grim age. I think our way of thinking, and this is completely untested, so we might be dead wrong, is that once your pack years are behind you, you're not changing them. You know, and so we wanted things that were more fluid, uh, if if you will. All right, lovely. We have Larry Kellen next. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, you know, if you've looked at like the fast aging diseases like progeria, there's a few others. I mean, progeria is probably a good prediction of arterial sclerosis and other things and skin problems. I mean, it, it's it's formed by, you know, a single mutation in the lambda, I think the lambda A gene and you know, and then you even, even as you age, you seem to form more progeria or something, you know, just even if you don't have a genetic mutation, it seems to pop up a little bit. And did, do you see any correlation? I mean, are you able to separate out, you know, there's probably like a cardiovascular age or maybe an immunological age or maybe a cancer age, you know, depending, you know, that, that uh, are you able to sort things out at all, um, you know, by looking at various cohorts to, to see, you um, you know what you, you know if you can get more particular and 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 sort of um and and what these aging clocks really mean. Um, the progeria idea is a good one. I hadn't thought of that. One of the things that we are proposing to do with the Dunedin study is to um, is to focus in on uh, some of the things that we've been measuring for many years now that we have enough waves to really look carefully at say sexual aging. We now have enough variables that we have measured repeatedly from the twenties to the time that they're 50 in the next time we see them, they'll be 52. Uh, so sexual aging, inflammaging. So we have enough inflammatory biomarkers and measures of inflammation. And we're gonna do some in vitro work uh, with a, a cellular level response to an inflammatory challenge. Um, so we're, we're focusing in on, as you say, breaking this down into different, are there different kinds of aging? Um, uh, but, you know, a good way to do this would be, as you say, to import the pace of aging into some uh, medical research where there, people do have diseases like progeria. And, and just so far, we haven't gotten that export going. But now that we've made the pace of aging four waves and it's out there and True Diagnostics has licensed it for commercial purposes and will make the um, algorithm available to other research teams, I'm hoping that it'll spread. It's now being, um, it's available in the health and retirement study, uh, for example, so you can download their data set uh, and look at it in that context. And they have Medicare records, for example. Wait, I think we're now at the hour, but I think Terry at least said that you can stay on a little bit longer. Daniel, I think we would have two questions to go to. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, let's 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 try to uh, value time and make them quick. Next one up, we have Daniel. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Terry and Daniel. Really interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask whether there's been any investigation about the basis of, say, slow pace of aging or fast pace of aging. I remember reading about the Jundin study. I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong, but for the first time, and there were three individuals that just didn't age over the period of the study. And I just wanted to know who are these individuals. What are they doing? Where they live? You know, and obviously there's privacy concerns, but you know, like at least I could just follow what they were doing. It wouldn't do me any harm. Um, is there any investigation around that? You know, we, we haven't published any papers on slow agers, but it's something that we're we're always kind of looking at. And what we're looking for is something about them that is not just on a continuum from fast to slow, something that's special, that's discontinuous. Uh, so we need to set our minds to really doing that. We're hoping with the four waves now and, and extending to five waves with the next follow-up at age 52, we'll have enough precision to really identify quite a substantial group of slow agers. So that's definitely on our radar. What I can tell you is that because the Dunedin study um, represents all the babies born in one city and uh, we still have 94% of them taking part, it represents all walks of life. And we do have, you know, Olympic athletes in there. Um, there, you know, there are uh, quite some quite amazing uh, people with really, truly amazing lifestyles. Thanks, Terry. Maybe you have to track them down, Daniel. <laughs> okay, lovely. Next one up um, over here, we perhaps have one more, which was Vadim. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is actually a super exciting work. I'm really looking forward to see how it develops further. So my question is, uh, since you have data for uh, younger ages uh, during childhood development, and when you apply your Dunedin pace uh, clock or Bombay marker to this data, somehow in your slides it was uh, missing. So I, I wonder why, how it behaves, and what do you think it means in terms of the nature of aging? Maybe Dan, do you the, have the that last slide? Yeah, the, the, you're asking for the data on the uh, the childhood adversity. Is that right? No. Uh, so you have you have uh, data for or at least samples for younger ages, right? And so you, if you apply your Dunedin pace by a marker to younger ages, just ah. follow them from the age of three until let's say twenty. How does it behave? Does the age increase? or pace of age of aging increase, or stays constant or decreases? And what do you think it means? How far back does it go? I can give you a sneak peek at a finding. We haven't published this yet. We haven't written it up, but we have looked back uh, because so many people ask us this question that you brought up. It's such a good one. So we identified the things that are available in the data set. We don't have all of those um, bio, same biomarkers going right back to birth, but we have things like intrauterine growth retardation. So the birth weight and, and age at... Um, um, no, you, you don't need biomarkers. You just apply the clock. You just measure DNA methylation by EPIC and just uh, ask a question. How does the biomarker, what does it show? Ah, uh, we don't have the DNA methylation for, oh, done. Okay. for the met childhood ages. However, we do have a sample of newborns in Scotland, five days old, that we have DNA methylation for. So this is a new thing that we can do. Okay. But what I was going to leak to you is just that if you look back and ask um, at uh, uh, time, point bio, time point markers of maturation, such as when they first walked, first talked, their adipose rebound uh, in infancy, when they, you know, sort of gain and lose weight there around uh, when they're little kids, uh, age at puberty, uh, onset of menarche, uh, menopause, things like that. So we have those kinds of things. And the pace of aging is related to some of those um, uh, developmental milestones in very early life. Okay, so that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Yeah. So I think just one sort of follow up to Vadim's question. I think we would really like to know how the pace of aging changes across the early part of the lifespan. Um, but there aren't a lot of uh, blood data from those pediatric cohorts. Uh, there are other tissues that are, are more often collected. Um, this is why the Cobor lab built their clock for buccal cells. Um, and it's why I think there, there are many groups uh, working to try and translate these blood-based assessments to saliva, which is, you know, includes leukocytes, so the same kinds of cells, at least, that, that we're getting DNA from in blood. Um, 
and uh, you know, so would would expand the opportunities to ask that question um, in in these young children. All right. Well, before we close it, I want to give uh, Carl the opportunity that if he wants to have his question addressed now. <laughs> well, I just want to point out to you guys that I think this data on the functional declines that you see in the 20s and 30s is super important. Um, it's surprising and it's stark. I and mean, it's not surprising to me or to most of the people of this call probably, but you know, those huge declines that, that you started out showing that happened you know, even before age 40, you know, I think the the public doesn't really fully appreciate that. And I think that it's super important for people to, you know, to get more um, sympathy for the field and more people interested in solving aging, that they, you know, that things like those sort of stark functional declines that a lot of people don't notice because they, you know, they have these desk jobs or whatever, you know, how do we make that more publicly available? I, I don't know. I, it's not a specific suggestion, but, you know, I think it'd be great if that data could become more widely known. Yeah, I've been thinking of maybe writing a trade book about, you know, how to um, give your uh, act now to give your children a, a happy old age, <laughs> you know, more guilt for parents. But yeah, the time to, to do something is is as early as you can. I also think back to when we submitted our first grant proposal to do this work on aging in the Dunedin study and really all of the peer reviewers said there won't be any variation. People don't start aging until after 60. And no. I thought... Have these guys never seen, you know, tried a bathing suit on when they were 30 that they used to wear when they were 20? Is it the Olympics just that? happened? Carly Lloyd just retired from the US women's national team. And it was big news about how her struggle to keep being relevant at age 37, right? I mean, you know, it's it, people in sports really know this stuff. Maybe uh, it's too bad that Keith has dropped off because he, you know, his organization does a lot of trying to sort of promote these these angles, but you know. I think this, the, the, your data perfectly well shows why athletes don't perform at the top peak levels after their 30s, for example. Great, I lovely. Great I, point. Yeah, I'm posting our podcast with a few episodes, for example, from Mia Basilai on targeting aging with metformin and Alex on longevity as a service. And here, in case uh, you want to share them, uh, that's easily accessible with the public. And Carl has done a fantastic job at collating a lot of our, uh, a lot of people's a podcast into an actual spreadsheet. Um, so I think there are good ways in which people could get up to speed on uh, on this kind of stuff. Um, okay, I want to I may perhaps close before we get to what can this group uh, do to help you guys along. Um, maybe just um, if you remember it, Terry, do you want to say out your longevity challenge that you posted to the group out loud as a, a kind of thing that you'd like to pay people to pay more attention to? And then we would like to close with what could this group do uh, to further your, uh, your work? But what would be helpful for people listening in on this as well? Okay, my first challenge is not really very challenging, it's quite easy, is that methylation is still kind of expensive for randomized clinical trials. And so we really need um, all of these measures converted into something that's really cheap and easy. Um, so that's one challenge. Um, <clears throat> and then my other uh, challenge was is actually quite difficult. And it's the same one that Jamie Justice raised. And that is that we need some known proven um, uh, treatments that really do slow aging so that we can use them as a benchmark to evaluate all of the, the clocks and measures of pace of aging against. So, um, you know, we're in that sort of stuck period where we need some, we need some outcome measures for the trials and we need some successful trials to evaluate the outcome measures. Okay, fantastic. And now onto the last one, what could this group, uh, who is present right now in the Zoom room, I guess, but also further folks who watch us afterwards on YouTube uh, do that would help you guys' work along. Mm. Any good ideas, Dan? And checks. Um, uh, I think... Uh, Where to? <laughs> right. Um, I, I think certainly for the many folks on the call who do work in aging science and are participating in, leading, uh, collaborating with randomized controlled trials of a wide range of interventions and cohort studies, taking measurements like ours uh, and putting them to the test in your studies uh, is really what we need. Um, I think there are so many uh, randomized trials of interventions that we know when they're effective do extend lifespan uh, that simply haven't been uh, examined with 
the kinds of aging biomarkers we're developing. Um, the look ahead trial is, is, is one example. Um, and those trials provide a setting in which it might be feasible to address uh, Temi's uh, you know, proposed challenge uh, to evaluate whether in fact these biomarkers are sensitive to change. Um, I think that um, to those of you who are um, bioinformaticians and molecular biologists dealing with uh, the measurement of molecular quantities, uh, efforts to translate these array-based measures into sequencing-based approaches are another frontier um, where we could potentially improve the reliability of measurement. And it appears that sequencing generates more reliable data than, than the array-based approaches, um, but also reduce costs because you don't have to, to swallow the whole genome. You just need targeted sequencing of the identified sites. Um, uh, and then uh, I think that, you know, a third, and I, perhaps I'm, I'm sort of, these are more challenges than things that folks on the call can, can directly do, but I guess I have a high opinion of what those on the call are capable of, uh, uh, is, the, um, is, is this sort of cross-tissue uh, consistency of these measurements or cross-tissue translations of these measurements. And those are things that, that we're working on, um, but that will take uh, participation from a full research community, not just a handful of labs. And, uh, and, and I guess, do, you know, specifically- What do you do research? You do, do it in African-Americans and uh, Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans, as well as in um, uh, whites, because we have no idea how measures of aging are, are working in um, ethnic, different ethnic variation. We really need to expand out our horizons in that way. Okay, fantastic. Very, very tangible, at least. Uh, thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you from everyone on this call. It was really, really fantastic, a fantastic work. Um, I'm posting a link to our fellowship applications, which are open starting now. It's at least a soft launch. So we have lots of uh, folks that will join us um, in a little bit more of a um, of a targeted supportive fashion uh, throughout the next year. Uh, and so if uh, that may be you, uh, or if that's someone uh, that you know, who uh, is working on longevity escape velocity, who should be supported, then perhaps uh, um, point them to this form. All right, thank you so, so much again from everyone uh, on this call for taking time. It was really fantastic. And I'm really looking forward uh, to having you perhaps on again next year um, to have another update. And you see lots of hands clapping here uh, on, on mute. Thank you, thank you so, so much. And I look forward to following up with you. Bye everyone, thank you for joining. Yeah, thanks so much to everyone who came out. Really appreciate it. Sure do.